Um, thank you so much for inviting me today. It's a real honor to be here. I've been impressed with Code for America for many years and um, really impressed with the tremendous work that everybody has done to put this on. I'm particularly interested in Code for America because of the innovative nature of the organization and really rethinking about how we can help uh, create new organizations to help government serve those who need it most. And thank you to you all who are here on a sunny day, the first sunny day I hear that Oakland has had in a while, um, to reflect on how we can make positive impact in our organizations, including our government, schools, hospitals, neighborhoods, and beyond. So I wanna start this uh, time with a question that I've been asking myself for some time. And the question is this, why, when we often have good intentions, do we fail to make impact, the impact we were hoping to make? My belief is that it has something to do with the way that we are identifying and tackling social challenges. And so today, I wanna to talk, tell you about the problem-solving approach that starts with a simple question, why? Not what, where, how, but why? And you'll hear um, iteration or echoes of what you've heard in the previous talk. So why, we might ask, why is this challenge important to society's well-being? Why is this cha ha challenge happening now? And I'm gonna argue that by asking, not asking why, we risk addressing the wrong challenges and being blindsided by assumptions, giving up when the going gets tough, offering solutions that don't help, and missing new opportunities for impact. So by asking why, we can radically explain, expand our approach to identifying and tackling important social challenges in our communities and more reliably make long-term sustainable impact. So to convince you of this argument, I'm going to describe the organization Design for America that we started in 2008 to illustrate to which Corey was referring. So for those of you who don't know, Design for America started over a decade ago. As Corey mentioned, I'm a professor and I was sitting with three students on my floor in my office at Northwestern University in Chicago. And we were wondering at that time, could we create a networked organization that would allow both undergrads and graduate students throughout the US to work together with community partners to tackle complex problems using the human-centered design approach that you heard previously? From a personal standpoint, I had been very strongly influenced by my, my youth. I grew up as a young girl in Burlington, Vermont. Bernie Sanders was the mayor. Perhaps you're familiar with the name. As the mayor, Bernie was best known for his effort to, to lead a downtown and lakefront revitalization process. What this meant is instead of turning over the land to, um, to, wealth to people who wanted to build wealthy condos for the wealthy, um, instead he really focused on building affordable housing and accessible parks and public spaces. So in short, he, grew he was trying to put people's needs at the center of the city of Burlington. I was also inspired by the time by the Peace Corps, who, Peace Corps, who had mobilized youth to support economic and social development abroad starting in the 1960s. And then of course, Teach for America, which I think we all have been inspired by that encouraged a new generation of teachers. So our vision for Design for America was to have college, every college campus host a design studio to use um, and use design to mobilize youth in their communities. At the time, we wanted to create this network because we believed a few things. One, young adults were being ignored as problem solvers. For too long, they had been treated as passive actors, not active creators. But we saw, clearly through the 2008 Obama campaign, we saw that as an inflection point. Young adults clearly wanted an active role. So that was reason number one. Two, we thought to improve the long-term health of society, we needed a healthy pipeline of young adults who identified, it, identified as change leaders, regardless of their expertise, whether they were in law, medicine, technology, environment, anything else. We wanted future leaders to be better prepared and better equipped to work together to set, tackle ch complex challenges in a way that prioritized well-being of society over individual material gain. And third, as been, has been talked about at this conference quite a bit, the complexity of the challenges we are now facing is too great to be solved by when any one individual entity to tackle income inequality, childhood obesity, and global warming, and many more problems. We need a network of partners between private and public sectors. And this extensive network that we thought to, thought to bring, build rather, could help scale nationally challenges that we we're addressing on a hyper-local level. So today, I'm proud to say we're making progress towards this vision. 
We now have 39 university-based studios and 1,200 uh, 1, passionate students actively working right now on 120 projects across domains, including environment, education, healthcare, and the economy. And the students' work is supported through our now extensive mentor and alumni network. We've um, graduated thousands of, of alum who, who stay actively involved and support the, the undergrad and graduate community. And we host virtual and personal meetups, much like Code for America, throughout the country every month, as well as convenings like this one. So where do these students go after school? Well, after graduating, these students often may start a nonprofit or a for-profit organization to pursue the projects that they started in school. And as they grow, it's been really exciting for me to see them um, then hire new, new alum from uh, Design for America to help their growing organizations. And then there's others who go to work for industry or government, and they introduce human-centered design to their managers and to their colleagues. And then a curious effect I didn't anticipate was that many of the students who come to the United States to train as undergrads and graduate students then return to their native countries and are spreading the model there. So we currently have students working in Taiwan, graduates working in Taiwan, Pakistan, and China to spread the Design for America model for change, obviously with a different name, but the same idea. So as Corey mentioned, we were recently awarded this Smithsonian Institutional Achievement Award for using this network model to raise awareness and spread design ac across the country and abroad. So I know you've just heard about the human-centered process, design process from the previous speaker. I'll, I'll briefly touch on it, how we think about it in Design for America. We start the students by helping them identify challenge areas that um, that are personally motivating to them. This is incredibly important. I can't say how important it is for the students to be personally motivated. We then ask them to ask, what's the intersection of their personal motivation with what is important to society? Because to solve a problem that's just important to you but not for society doesn't, doesn't meet the needs of our organization. And then thirdly, and very importantly, we ask that they solve, um, they tackle challenges that are accessible to them, which means that they can connect with stakeholders directly. So consider Matt, um, one of our Design for America students a couple years ago. He chose to work with a local retirement home in the city of Chicago because he wanted to reduce nighttime falls uh, for older adults. Why? Because the month before, his grandmother had fallen during the night and um, had suffered an injury that then put her in the hospital um, for much longer than, than they all, the whole family had wished. On the other hand, we have students like Yuri, who personally experienced um, an incident. He was in a local hospital requiring, or rather recovering from a collapsed lung and became very interested in this notion of hospital acquired infections. For anybody who doesn't know of this idea, it's, I find it interesting. You go to the hospital, get well, but unfortunately you gather an additional infection while there, um, extending, again, extending your, your hospital stay. So as you can see, Matt and Yuri were looking at problems that were personally motivating to them, important to society, and, and accessible. So the Design for America um, process then guides the students to the root cause of the challenge by working with students who are working, sorry, working with people who are directly experiencing the challenge. So in the case of Matt, it was working with the local retirement home to redu reduce nighttime falls among older adults. While there, he and his team worked with a diverse team of older adults, caregivers, medical physicians, family members, house, house cleaners, room cleaners, facilities, and many more. There were many people who had insights into this opportunity. So rather than working exclusively on secondhand sources at Design for America, we emphasize primary, conducting primary research in the field with multiple stakeholders who might be impacted by the challenge. We ask the teams be able to get to the community partner and to make it really concrete and specific for the college students and the graduate students, we say, can you get there within a 15 minute bus, bike or, bike or train ride? And this is incredibly important because too often I observe that we are trying to tackle problems that we don't understand and we're not significant, uh, sufficiently close to the people um, challenging them or experiencing them. So after this initial research, they, teams often rescope their challenge to focus on the root cause. So let's consider the case of Sophia, who was working to improve literacy among elementary school children. It turned out that for her, one of the root causes was actually the lack of affordable glassware for many of these children. After generating, iterating and generating many ideas with the community and in the community, Sophia, and her team actively worked to sustainably implement solutions. 
So by working in close proximity with partners, she, could more, she and her team could more easily see their impact, or often the lack of impact, of their ideas. So Design for America was explicitly created upon the belief that it's not enough to create a PowerPoint deck and send it over and assume the, the ideas will be implemented, but actually to see what works and what more often does not work and continue to work, until, to continue to work on the problem until something does work. So just to set context again, I want to remind you of, of the age of these people. The amazing thing is these are all 18 to 25-year-olds. They're doing this work voluntarily. They're doing it on top of their schoolwork. They don't receive formal credit from the university to do this. And I often have my colleagues, my faculty colleagues and parents coming to me saying they've never seen their students work harder. And I have to explain to them that what we are doing, this is a commentary on what we are doing on, in higher education, is that we're not often supporting mission-driven learning. So how are the teams set up? Also an interesting reflection of, of higher education. In Design for America, we have the teams be interdisciplinary teams. And we know the interdisciplinary teams are absolutely critical for solving the complex problems we face today. So for example, you might find a music major, an engineer, a psychologist, and a biologist working um, to improve the quality of drinking water outside Detroit. You might find a business, physics, English, and government major working to reduce food insecurity in New York, or perhaps a computer science, geography, and art major working to increase accessible transportation in Seattle. So while it's possible for many, some of these students to learn about human-centered design in higher education, many miss out because human-centered design historically has been offered to STEM students. And the teams on which they work, as I alluded to earlier, are often far from interdisciplinary. Further, what happens in classes is many students are working on what we call toy problems with known answers rather than real-world problems. And the reason for this is because we are cons inevitably constrained by the semester system. We have 16 weeks to get through a curriculum. And quite honestly, the fault is also faculty. It's easier to teach and assign problems to which we know the answers. So as one, t one Design for America student once told me, appropriately, he said, you know, we're used to teachers handing us problems on a platter. That's what we're used to. And so I always question myself, how in the world do we expect these people to be ready to address the complexity of real world problems if we're handing them problems on a platter in higher education? And research has told us over and over again that teaching skill divorced from application can often drive students away. So that's some background in Design for America. I'm now going to return to my initial argument, which is, um, which is this. By not asking why, we risk the solving the wrong problem, being blindsided by our assumptions, giving up when the going gets tough, offering solutions that don't help, and missing new opportunities for impact. By asking why, early and often, we can expand our approach to identify and tackling social challenges in our communities to more reliably make impact. So here's the good news, is that as we know, anybody certainly who has children in this room knows that many of us start young by asking why. I'm a mother of two young children, and here are just a range of questions I was asked in a single day by my son last week. Why, mom, do we only have dessert two days a week, not seven? Why do some kids get free lunch at school? And why does the crosswalk sign feature a white man and not an African-American man? As young children, we regularly ask why. A bit more good news, as far as I can tell, my research suggests that why exists in every language, so excuse me for anybody who speaks these languages, but in Spanish, we say por qué. In Chinese, we shema. Hindu, kun kar. German, warkam. You get the idea. There's a word in every language for why. So given the universality of asking why, let's explore what happens when we ask why. The first is when we start by asking why, we get at the root cause of a challenge. And we avoid tackling the wrong challenge. So for example, when the Design for America team wanted to reduce hospital-acquired infections, they asked why these infections occur. They learned about the importance of doctors and nurses washing their hands, in not just in between patients, but also while working with a single patient. When they asked why were doctors and nurses not washing hands with the necessary frequency, 
they learned that it wasn't that doctors and nurses did not care about the patient's health. In fact, it was the very opposite. They cared so much that they were often, they got distracted by focusing on the relationship with the patient and forgot about washing their hands. So the challenge that these four students, Mert, Hannah, Yuri, and Casey were trying to tackle was how to remind doctors and nurses to wash their hands at key points in interactions with patients. So through this example, I hope to show you that we can't not effectively take on challenges that we don't understand. We must start by asking why. Why is this a challenge? So the exercise we use that perhaps some of you are familiar with, and I, I simply adore, is um, an exercise we call Five Whys. It's an iterative inter interrogation technique used to explore the cause and effect relationships underlying a challenge. So the primary goal of the technique is to determine the root cause by repeating the question why at least five times. Each answer forms the basis of the next question. So let me provide you with a simple demonstration. Why was I late for work the other day? Well, I missed the bus. Why did I miss the bus? I overslept. Why did I oversleep? I stayed up working too late. Why am I staying up working so late? I'm not asking for enough help at work. The root cause of me missing the bus last week is me not asking for enough help. So now, this is the interactive portion, I warn you. Um, I want you to try this with your with somebody sitting next to you. It may mean some of you have to move a little closer. Um, or you can ask yourself these questions. Why did you come to this talk? So take a moment to look at your partner, the person next to you, or reflect to yourself and ask yourself why, five whys. I'll give, you one, I'll give you two minutes to do this and then we'll come back. Go ahead, ask yourself why. Why did you come to this talk? You can ask yourself. It's a great opportunity to meet people. Move a little closer. Nice. How did that go? Did you learn something new? By a show of hands, did anybody come for the desire to learn something new? Okay. Anybody come with the desire for social justice, to have social justice in the world? Okay, a few more. A desire just to meet new people, have social contact. Great. Um, I have found through doing this exercise over the last 20 years that if you ask enough times, you inevitably come to one of the, f one of the 15 or so fundamental human desires and values as, des as identified by psychologists. So I imagine in this room, many of the motivating causes are around curiosity, citizenship, social contact, independence, and so on. And so as a technologist, I'm always so in intrigued by this activity because as a tech, trained as a form, formally trained as a technologist, I, I often lead with technology as the solution. The solution is technology. Um, and asking why always reminds me that I really need to lose, uh, lead with the challenge and not with the solution. I give you a little background. Um, at, at the toughness that this has been for me to learn. Um, since I was a little girl living in Burlington, Vermont, with Bernie Sanders as the mayor, um, I've loved to build. In my childhood bedroom, with, adorned with rose wallpaper, I built an extensive Rube Goldberg machine running from my ceiling light switch to my bedside table so I could turn off my ceiling lights without leaving my bed. I was very proud. Thank you. Somebody laughed in the beginning. Somebody else has done this. Thank you. If I had asked perhaps why I needed to turn off my lights by my bedside, I would have learned that it was really the reason I built that 
gadgetry. It was really about my desire to learn how to build a Rube Goldberg machine rather than the actual necessity of building that thing. I'm sure my mother would have appreciated it had I not built that. Um, and then when I was eight, continuing my building streak, I built a skateboard with two by fours and four wheels pilfered from a grocery cart. My goal was to ride with the neighborhood boys on the half pipe ramp. <laughs> you can imagine how successful that was. Um, if I had asked why I wanted to build a skateboard, well, it was my desire to be in the company of others, particularly these neighborhood kids. I could have probably come up with other solutions that would have addressed this concern um, in ways that were not threatening to my life, like that two by four uh, skateboard that I de designed and then rode. So I share these stories from my childhood to show you that my lifelong love of technology has often blinded me from addressing the core issue and asking why. So let me bring you back into Design for America. Um, recently working with a Chicago-based healthcare center um, that serves underserved patients in Chicago, uh, the team was interested, the team at the healthcare center was interested in increasing access to digital health records by designing a new app. So this is probably something that you're familiar, a familiar challenge. So when the team asked why, why did they want to design a new app? They learned that the health clinic wanted to do so for two reasons. The first reason was patient-centered. They wanted patients to be able to access test results and records anywhere at any time to improve the health outcomes. And the second was financially motivated. With greater adoption of healthcare records, the healthcare clinic could receive more funding from the state. So when the team asked patients, the Design for America team asked patients why they weren't accessing the records, the answer was many of them at this time, this was about five years ago, didn't have smartphones. And they explained that accessing these records re require them to go to the public library and reserve time on the public computer to access the internet. And when they asked the doctors why they were not fully accessing the records, the doctors again explained just lack of time, too many patients, too little time. So in short, this was a great lesson in understanding that the original ask, which was an app, was actually not the, right, the appropriate solution for the patients who did not have ready access to smart technology. And the team ultimately developed other clinic-based solutions, many of which were non-technical, to support adoption. So a second reason we might ask why, beyond getting to the root cause, is to really what it does is it forces us to talk with real people. Um, talking with re real people, I have found, leads to trusted and committed relationships. And trust and commitment is absolutely critical for tackling the difficult challenges that often require years and years of painful trial and error. So consider another Design for America team that I described earlier who wanted to reduce the hospital acquired infections. It took the team five years from the initial meeting with the hospital to measurable impact of reducing hospital acquired infections through hand hygiene. If it hadn't been for their original investment in the relationships formed by asking the question why, I'm not sure if they would have persisted. So going back when they were 19, within the first week of the project, the, the, the team came back and reported that with interviews with doctors and nurses, all agreed unanimously on the importance of hand hygiene. It was clear to them, it was absolutely clear that, that they should do it. Um, it wasn't clear to them why they weren't doing it. So I encouraged the team to spend more time at the hospital. So on one Friday afternoon after classes, the team went over to the hospital and spent, spent the overnight shift at the hospital. And during this time, not only did they get to observe doctors and nurses um, in action with the patients, but they also observed that these were very well-intended staff who were simply forgetting to wash their hands at the appropriate moment. And so they learned more deeply that they wanted to, but they were forgetting. And also at this time, through the ritual 2, 2 a.m. pizza and joke telling, which happens, I understand now, um, they developed friendships with these doctors and nurses and a real relationship. And so the team then went home after the weekend and developed a series of personal hand hygiene devices. Um, these were things that fit on the doctors and nurses so they could, they could wash their hands right on site. Um, and they went back to the hospital staff and they showed them the mock-ups um, of these ideas. And the staff and nurses, I say, respectfully laughed. They said, no way would we ever use those. There's no way we'd ever do that. So the team was discouraged by their first failed attempt, but because of the relationship and the promise they had made to the nurses and doctors about their 
intention to help them with this challenge. They promised to return with more ideas. So then they began working much more directly with the staff, coming back on a regular basis, and developing new ideas. So it took the team five years, with many lows and, and some highs, and I'm convinced that had they not worked closely with the stakeholders, most closely affected, I'm not sure if they would have perse uh, persevered. I came across a great Nietzsche quote the other day that seemed to encapsulate this spirit, which was, he who has he who has a why to live for, he or she who has a why to live for, can bear almost any how. So the third reason and final reason I'll discuss today about why we might ask why we might ask why is that fundamentally it strengthens our curiosity. And by being curious, we can learn more about opportunities for impact. So curiosity is often described as motivating us to close the gap between what we know and what we don't know. So, for example, to bring back my son, when working on a science report last week, my son learned and told me that a bat can eat up to half its weight in bugs in a single evening. I was impressed. But upon learning this, he realized he didn't know how big the biggest bat was and the smallest bat was. By asking why, he learned that the biggest bat has a wingspan of six feet and the smallest bat is the size of a bumblebee. So don't let it said you didn't learn about bats at Code for America. So consider the, the Design for America team led by Hannah and Aaron. They were interested in helping kids diagnosed with diabetes. Like the other Design for America teams, um, they were asking the kids um, why, 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 was, why was this happening? They spent time um, in their homes, they spent time in school classes, uh, classrooms learning. And what they learned is um, that kids often don't feel empowered to take care of themselves. And so in response, they created something called Jerry the Bear, um, and they, crafted their, uh, they actually crafted their schoolwork around this so that they could learn the necessary robotics and, and programming to build this interactive teddy bear that effectively allows kids with type 1 diabetes to, to learn how to take care of themselves by taking care of Jerry. And for those of a certain age in the room, I like to describe this as the Tamaguchi of the 90s with diabetes. So in doing work and asking why these kids were at risk, they also learned about other life-threatening illnesses in which kids felt unempowered and yet regularly faced. And so now they're working on a project, a special duck, which is very sweet, um, which brings comfort to kids going through cancer treatment. And what it does is through interactivity, it brings kids a much needed sense of control in a, in a case when they often don't feel in control. So this is their work by asking why has spurred a whole new genre of patient supported approaches to improving health outcomes, particularly for kids. So I'll conclude by, by reminding you, I've presented three reasons for asking why. The first one is get to the root cause. The second one is gain commitment needed to overcome the inevitable challenges faced when taking on complex challenges. And the third one is to gain insight for new opportunities. And so now for the skeptics in the room, I'll address two, two critiques that you may be having right now. Can asking why too much lead to what we call analysis paralysis, or the state when an individual overthinks a situation and becomes paralyzed in making a decision? So at Design for America, we think a lot about analysis paralysis. And we overcome it by not just asking why, but simultaneously also building prototypes. So recall the team who was at the hospital and returned home to bring, pro bring new prototypes back into the hospital and simultaneously ask why again. In another case, a recent case with Design for America team was working with the YMCA. The YMCA asked Design for America for help recruiting college kids to be lifeguards. When Design for America asked why they needed to do this, the team learned that learning how to swim is a critical life skill and often takes practice. And with the upcoming shortage of lifeguards at the Y, the Y was starting to close down local swimming pools. So at the same time as asking why, the team started to build prototypes to learn more about the challenge. So as, um, to understand why the YMCA was recruiting as they were, they, they showed the YMCA a recruitment poster of Uncle Sam saying, we want you. Perhaps you're familiar with this. Often recruit, used to recruit um, people into the military. And by presenting the prototype that they made, not seriously, but just as a fun way of provoking, um, it actually made the Y ask, why, aren't we focus, why are we fo so focused on recruiting college students who are increasingly not interested in this position? but why don't we start recruiting military veterans who are both motivated by a sense of service and most often trained in CPR and first aid. 
And so the Y right now is starting to pursue, um, pursue this effort. So at Design for America, we avoid the analysis paralysis by prototyping solutions in parallel to increase both the rate of learning as well as to start to understand possible solutions. So a second critique that I often receive and think about myself is, can we truly know everything? Can we ask, can we ever get to the bottom of everything? And the, the truth is no. The rate at which the world is changing makes this impossible. And so we must scope our challenges and the span of que questions and the, the area in which we ask why. So consider a team working with the city of Chicago to extend Chicago's 220 offices to all new immigrant families in the city. By working with the mayor's office, the team identified 300 different groups of stakeholders. 300. They classified their stakeholders as primary and secondary, as designers are apt to do. And the primary stakeholders were those who had both the power and, and or the interest in tackling the challenge. They didn't focus on the people with low power or low interest in, solving, in tackling the challenge, but rather they were focused on the people who really were motivated to do something. Ultimately, the team ended up pursuing or is pursuing a solution that's focusing on neighborhoods with high populations of in immigrant entrepreneurs who are most eager to work with city services to start new business, businesses and create a new life for themselves. So as my talk comes to a close, I hope you are convinced um, that starting your approach to tackling challenges with the question why, you're more likely to identify and solve important problems in your cities, schools, governments, communities instead of the wrong problem. I, I guarantee you, you will be motivated to keep going when the going gets tough, and you will continuously realize new opportunities for impact. So my call to action for you today as you head out to lunch is ask why. Why, why, why? Thank you very much.